Santa Claus and Little Billy by John Kendrick Bangs, narrated by Taylor Seth Hall. He was only a little bit of a chap, and so when, for the first time in his life, Little Billy came into contact with the endless current of human things, it was as hard for him to stay put as for some wayward little atom of flotsam and jetsam to keep from tossing about in the surging tides of the sea. His mother had left him there in the big toy shop, with instructions not to move until she came back, while she went off to do some mysterious errand. She thought, no doubt, that with so many beautiful things on every side to delight his eye and hold his attention, strict obedience to her commands would not be hard. But, alas, the good lady reckoned not upon the magnetic power of attraction of all those lovely objects in detail. She saw them only as a mass of wonders, which, in all probability, would so dazzle his vision as to leave him incapable of movement. But little Billy was not so indifferent as all that. When a phonograph at the other end of the shop began to rattle off melodious tunes and funny jokes, in spite of the instructions he received, off he pattered as fast as his little legs would carry him to investigate. After that, forgetful of everything else, finding himself caught in the constantly moving stream of Christmas shoppers, he was borne along in the resistless current until he found himself at last upon the street, alone, free, and independent. It was great fun at first. By and by, however, the afternoon waned. The sun, as if anxious to hurry along the dawn of Christmas Day, sank early to bed, and the electric lights along the darkening highway began to pop out here and there, like so many merry stars come down to earth to celebrate the gladdest time of all the year. Little Billy began to grow tired, and then he thought of his mamma, and tried to find the shop where he had promised to remain quiet until her return. Up and down the street he wandered until his little legs grew weary, but there was no sign of the shop nor of the beloved face he was seeking. Once again, and yet once again after that, did the little fellow traverse the crowded highway, his tears getting harder and harder to keep back. And then, joy of joys, whom should he see walking slowly down the sidewalk but Santa Claus himself? The saint was strangely decorated with two queer-looking boards with big red letters on them, hung over his back and chest, but there was still that same kindly grey-bearded face, the red cloak with the fur trimmings, and the same dear old cap that the children's friend had always worn in the pictures of him that little Billy had seen. With a glad cry of happiness, little Billy ran to meet the old fellow and put his hand gently into that of the saint. He thought it very strange that Santa Claus's hand should be so red and cold and rough and so chapped, but he was not in any mood to be critical. He had been face to face with a very disagreeable situation. Then, when things had seemed blackest to him, everything had come right again and he was too glad to take more than passing notice of anything strange and odd. Santa Claus, of course, would recognize him at once, and would know just how to take him back to his mamma at home, wherever that might be. Little Billy had never thought to inquire just where home was. All he knew was that it was a big grey stone house on a long street somewhere, with a tall iron railing in front of it, not far from the park. How do, Mr. Santa Claus? said little Billy, as the other's hand unconsciously tightened over his own. Why, how do, Kitty? replied the old fellow, glancing down at his new-found friend, with surprise gleaming from his deep-set eyes. Where did you drop from? Oh, I'm out, said little Billy bravely. My mamma left me a little while ago while she went off about something, and I guess I got losted. Very likely, returned the old saint with a smile. Little two-by-four fellows are apt to get losted when they start in on their own hook, especially days like these, with such crowds hustling around. But it's all right now, suggested little Billy hopefully. I'm found again, ain't I? 
Oh, yes, indeedy. You're, you're found all right, kitty, Santa Claus agreed. And pretty soon you'll take me home again, won't you? said the child. Surest thing you know, answered Santa Claus, looking down upon the bright but tired little face with a comforting smile. What might your address be? My what? asked little Billy. Your address, repeated Santa Claus. Where do you live? The answer was a ringing peal of childish laughter. <laughs> As if you didn't know that, cried little Billy, giggling. Ha! Ah! Ha! laughed Santa Claus. Can't fool you, can I? Uh, it would be funny if, after keeping an eye on you all these years since you was a baby, I didn't know where you lived, eh? Awfully funny, agreed little Billy. But tell me, Mr. Santa Claus, what sort of boy do you think I have been? He added with a shade of anxiety in his voice. Pretty good, pretty good, Santa Claus answered, turning in his steps and walking back again along the path he had just traveled, which little Billy thought was a rather strange thing to do. You've got more nice marks than naughty ones, a good many more, a hundred and fifty times as many, Kitty. Fact is, you're all right, way up among the good boys, though once or twice last summer, you know. Yes, I know, said little Billy meekly. But I didn't mean to be naughty. That's just what I said to the bookkeeper, said Santa Claus. And we gave you a middle mark, half nice and half naughty. That doesn't count either way, for or against you. Thank you, sir, said little Billy, much comforted. Don't mention it. You are very welcome, kitty, said Santa Claus, giving the youngster's hand a gentle squeeze. Why do you call me kitty when you know my name is little Billy? asked the boy. Oh, that's what I call all good boys, explained Santa Claus. You see, we divide them up into two kinds, the good boys and the naughty boys, and the good boys we call kiddies, and the naughty boys we call caddies, and there you are. Just then, little Billy noticed for the first time the square boards that Santa Claus was wearing. What are you wearing those boards for, Mr. Santa Claus? he asked. If the lad had looked closely enough, he would have seen a very unhappy look come into the old man's face, but there was nothing of it in his answer. Oh, those are my new fangled back and chest protectors, my lad, he replied. Sometimes we have bitter winds blowing at Christmas, and I have to be ready for them. It wouldn't do for Santa Claus to come down with the sneezes at Christmas time, you know. No, siree. This board in front keeps the wind off my chest, and the one behind keeps me from getting rheumatism in my back. They are a great protection against the weather. I'll have to tell my papa about them, said little Billy, much impressed by the simplicity of this arrangement. We have a glass board on the front of our automobile to keep the wind off Henry. He's our shuffer. But papa wears a fur coat, and sometimes he says the wind goes right through that. He'll be glad to know about these boards. I shouldn't wonder, smiled Santa Claus. They aren't very becoming, but they are mighty useful. You might save up your pennies and give your papa a pair like him for his next Christmas. <laughs> Santa Claus laughed as he spoke, but there was a catch in his voice which little Billy was too young to notice. You've got letters printed there, said the little boy, peering around in front of his companion at the letters on the board. What do they spell? You know I haven't learned to read yet. And why should you know how to read at your age? said Santa Claus. You're not more than... Five next month said little Billy proudly. It was a great age. My, as old as that, cried Santa Claus. Well, you are growing fast. Why, it don't seem more than yesterday that you was a pink-cheeked baby, and here you are, big enough to be out alone. That's more than my little boy is able to do. Santa Claus shivered slightly, and little Billy was surprised to see a tear glistening in his eye. Why, have you got a little boy? he asked. Yes, little Billy, said the saint, a poor, white-faced little chap, about a year older than you, who, well, never mind, kitty, he's a kitty too. Let's talk about something else, or I'll have icicles in my eyes. You didn't tell me what those letters on the board spell, said little Billy. Merry Christmas to everybody, said Santa Claus. I have the words printed there so everybody can see them, and if I miss wishing anybody a Merry Christmas, he'll know I meant it just the same. You're awful kind, aren't you? said little Billy, squeezing his friend's hand affectionately. It must make you very happy to be able to be so kind to everybody. 
Santa Claus made no reply to this remark, beyond giving a very deep sigh, which little Billy chose to believe was evidence of a great inward content. They walked on now in silence, for little Billy was beginning to feel almost too tired to talk, and Santa Claus seemed to be thinking of something else. Finally, however, the little fellow spoke. I guess I'd like to go home now, Mr. Santa Claus, he said. I'm tired, and I'm afraid my mama will be wondering where I've gone to. That's so, my little man, said Santa Claus, stopping short in his walk up and down the block. Your mother will be worried for a fact, and your father too. I know how I'd feel if my little boy got lost it and hadn't come home at dinner time. I don't believe you know where you live, though. Now, honest, come, fess up, Billy. You don't know where you live, do you? Why, yes, I do, said little Billy. It's in the big gray stone house with the iron fence in front of it, near the park. Oh, hoo, hoo. that's easy enough, laughed Santa Claus nervously. Anybody could say he lived in a gray stone house with a fence around it near the park. But you don't know what street it's on, nor the number, either. I'll bet fourteen wooden giraffes against a monkey on a stick. No, I don't, said little Billy frankly. But I know the number on our automobile. It's N.Y. Fine, laughed Santa Claus. If you really were lost, it would be of great help to know that. But not being lost as you ain't, why, of course, we can get along without it. It's queer you don't know your last name, though. I do, too, know my last name, blurted little Billy. It's Billy. That's the last one they gave me, anyhow. Santa Claus reflected for a moment, eyeing the child anxiously. I don't believe you even know your papa's name, he said. Yes, I do, said little Billy indignantly. His name is Mr. Harrison. Well, you are a smart little chap, cried Santa Claus gleefully. You got it right the very first time, didn't you? I really didn't think you knew. But I don't believe you know where your papa keeps his bake shop, where he makes all those nice cakes and cookies you eat. Billy began to laugh again. You can't fool me, Mr. Santa Claus, he said. I know my papa don't keep a bake shop just as well as you do. My papa owns a bank. Splendid! Made of tin, I suppose, with a nice little hole at the top to drop pennies into, said Santa Claus. No, it ain't either, retorted little Billy. It's made of stone and has more than a million windows in it. I went down there with my mama to papa's office the other day, so I guess I ought to know. Well, I should say so, said Santa Claus. Nobody better. By the by, Billy, what does your mama call your papa? Billy, like you, he added. Oh, no, indeed, returned little Billy. She calls him papa, except once in a while when he's going away, and then she says, goodbye, Tom. Fine again, said Santa Claus, blowing upon his fingers, for now that the sun had completely disappeared over in the west, it was getting very cold. Thomas Harrison, banker, he muttered to himself. But with the telephone book and the city directory, I guess we can find our way home with little Billy. Do you think we can go now, Mr. Santa Claus? asked little Billy, for the cold was beginning to cut through his little coat, and the sandman had started to scatter the sleepy seeds all around. Yes, sirree, returned Santa Claus promptly. Right away, off now, instantly at once. I'm afraid I can't get my reindeer here in time to take us up to the house, but we can go in the cars. Hmm, I don't know if we can or not, come to think of it. Uh, do you happen to have ten cents in your pocket? Santa Claus added with an embarrassed air. You see, I've left my pocketbook in the sleigh with my toy bag, and besides, mine is only toy money, and they won't take that on the cars. I got twenty-five cents said little Billy proudly as he dug his way down into his pocket and brought the shining silver piece to light. You can have it if you want. Thank you, said Santa Claus, taking the proffered coin. We'll start home right away, only come in here first, while I telephone to Santaville, telling the folks where I am. He led the little fellow into a public telephone station, where he eagerly scanned the names in the book. At last it was found, Thomas Harrison, 7654 Plaza. And then, in the seclusion of the telephone booth, Santa Claus sent the gladdest of all Christmas messages over the wire to two distracted parents. I have found your boy wandering in the street. He is safe, and I will bring him home right away. 
Fifteen minutes later, there might have been seen the strange spectacle of a foot-sore Santa Claus leading a sleepy little boy up Fifth Avenue to a cross street, which shall be nameless. The boy vainly endeavored to persuade his companion to come in and meet Mama. No, Billy, the old man replied sadly. I must hurry back. You see, Kitty, this is my busy day. Besides, I never go into a house except through the chimney. I wouldn't know how to behave going in at a front door. But it was not to be as Santa Claus willed, for little Billy's papa and his mama and his brothers and sisters and the butler and the housemaids and two or three policemen were waiting at the door when they arrived. Ah, said one of the policemen, seizing Santa Claus roughly by the arm. We've landed you all right. Where have you been with this boy? You let him alone, cried little Billy with more courage than he had ever expected to show in the presence of a policeman. He's a friend of mine. That's right, officer said little Billy's father. Let him alone. I haven't entered any complaint against this man. But you want to look out for these fellers, Mr. Harrison, returned the officer. First thing you know, they'll be making a trade of this sort of thing. I'm no grafter, retorted Santa Claus indignantly. I found the little chap wandering along the street, and as soon as I was able to locate where he lived, I brought him home. That's all there is to it. He knew where I lived all along, laughed little Billy. Only he pretended he didn't know, just to see if I knew. You see, sir, said the officer, it won't do him any harm to let him cool his heels. It is far better that he should warm them, officer, said Mr. Harrison kindly, and he can do that here. Come in, my man, he added, turning to Santa Claus with a grateful smile. Just for a minute, anyhow. Mrs. Harrison will wish to thank you for bringing our boy back to us. We have had a terrible afternoon. That's all right, sir said Santa Claus modestly. It wasn't anything, sir. It, I didn't really find him. It was him as found me, sir. He took me for the real thing, I guess. Nevertheless, Santa Claus, led by little Billy's persistent father, went into the house. Now that the boy could see him in the full glare of many electric lights, his furs did not seem the most gorgeous things in the world. When the flapping front of his red jacket flew open, the child was surprised to see how ragged was the thin grey coat it covered, and as for the good old saint's comfortable stomach, strange to say, it was not. "'I wish you all a Merry Christmas,' faltered Santa Claus, "'but I really must be going, sir.' "'Nonsense!' cried Mr. Harrison. "'Not until you have got rid of this chill, and—' "'I can't stay, sir,' said Santa. "'I'll lose my job if I do.' "'Well, what if you do?' "'I'll give you a better one,' said the banker. I can't, I can't, faltered the man. I, I've got a little Billy of my own at home waiting for me, sir. If I hadn't, he added fiercely, do you suppose I'd be doing this? He pointed at the painted boards and shuddered. It's him as has kept me from, from the river, he muttered hoarsely. And then this dispenser of happiness to so many millions of people all the world over sank into a chair and covered his face with his hands and wept like a child. I guess Santa Claus is tired, Papa, said little Billy, snuggling up closely to the old fellow and taking hold of his hand sympathetically. He's been walking a lot today. Yes, my son, said Mr. Harrison gravely. These are very busy times for Santa Claus, and I guess that as he still has a hard night ahead of him, James had better ring up Henry to tell him to bring the car around right away, so that we may take him back to his little boy. We'll have to lend him a fur coat to keep the wind off, too, for it is a bitter night. Oh, said little Billy, I haven't told you about these boards he wears. He has them to keep the wind off, and they're fine, Papa. Little Billy pointed at the two signboards which Santa Claus had leaned against the wall. He says he uses them on cold nights, the lad went on. They have writing on them, too. Do you know what it says? Yes, said Mr. Harrison, glancing at the boards. It says, if you want a good Christmas dinner for a quarter, go to Smither's Cafe. Little Billy roared with laughter. Papa's trying to fool me, just as you did when you pretended not to know where I lived, Santa Claus, he said, looking up into the old fellow's face, his own countenance brimming over with mirth. You mustn't think he can't read, though, the lad added hastily. He's only joking. Oh, no, indeed, I shouldn't have thought that replied Santa Claus, smiling through his tears. I've been joking, have I? said little Billy's papa. Well then, Mr. Billiam, suppose you inform me what it says on those boards. 
Merry Christmas to everybody, said Little Billy proudly. I couldn't read it myself, but he told me what it said. He has it printed there so that if he misses saying it to anybody, they'll know he means it just the same. By Jove, Mr. Santa Claus, cried Little Billy's papa, grasping the old man warmly by the hand. I owe you ten million apologies. I haven't believed in you for many a long year. But now, sir, I take it all back. You do exist, and by the great horn spoon, you are the real thing. Little Billy had the satisfaction of acting as host to Santa Claus at a good, luscious dinner, which Santa Claus must have enjoyed very much, because, when explaining why he was so hungry, it came out that the poor old chap had been so busy all day that he had not had time to get any lunch, no, not even one of those good dinners at Smithers Café, to which Little Billy's father had jokingly referred and after dinner Henry came with the automobile and, bidding everybody good night, Santa Claus and little Billy's papa went out of the house together. Christmas morning dawned, and little Billy awoke from wonderful dreams of rich gifts and of extraordinary adventures with his newfound friend to find the reality quite as splendid as the dream things. Later, what was his delight when a small boy, not much older than himself, a pale, thin, but playful little fellow, arrived at his house to spend the day with him, bringing with him a letter from Santa Claus himself. This was what the letter said. Dear little Billy, you must not tell anybody except your papa and your mamma, but the little boy who brings you this letter is my little boy, and I am going to let you have him for a playfellow for Christmas Day. Treat him kindly for his papa's sake. And if you think this papa is worth loving, tell him so. Do not forget me, little Billy. I shall see you often in the future, but I doubt if you will see me. I am not going to return to 23rd Street again, but shall continue my work in the land of Yule, in the Palace of Goodwill, whose beautiful windows look out upon the homes of all the good children. Goodbye, little Billy, and the happiest of Christmases to you and all of yours. Affectionately, Santa Claus. When little Billy's mamma read this to him that Christmas morning, a stray little tear ran down her cheek and fell upon little Billy's hand. Why, what are you crying for, mamma? he asked. With happiness, my dear little son, his mother answered. I was afraid yesterday that I might have lost my little boy forever, but now... You have an extra one thrown in for Christmas, haven't you? said little Billy, taking his new playmate by the hand. The visitor smiled back at him with a smile so sweet that anybody might have guessed that he was the son of Santa Claus. As for Santa Claus, little Billy has not seen him again. But down at his father's bank there is a new messenger named John, who has a voice so like Santa Claus's voice that whenever little Billy goes down there in the motor to ride home at night with his papa, he runs into the bank and has a long talk with him, just for the pleasure of pretending that it is Santa Claus he is talking to. Indeed, the voice is so like that once a sudden and strange idea flashed across little Billy's mind. Have you ever been on 23rd Street, John? he asked. 23rd Street? replied the messenger, scratching his head as if very much puzzled. What's that? Why, it's a street, said little Billy rather vaguely. Well, to tell you the truth, Billy, said John. I've heard tell of 23rd Street, and they say it is a very beautiful and interesting spot. But, you know, I don't get much chance to travel. I've been too busy all my life to go abroad. Abroad? roared little Billy, grinning at John's utterly absurd mistake. Why, 23rd Street ain't abroad. It's uptown, near... Uh, uh, near 22nd Street. Really? returned John, evidently tremendously surprised. Well, 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 who'd have thought that? Well, if that's the case, sometime when I get a week off, I'll have to go and spend my vacation there. From which little Billy concluded that his suspicion that John might be Santa Claus in disguise was entirely without foundation in fact. Next week on the Storytime Classics podcast, a fictional story from the first Christmas called 
the shepherd who didn't go. Remember that all episodes now have companion ebooks available for free download in PDF and EPUB formats. You can find them on the Storytime Classics official webpage. The link is in the description. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram. If you are enjoying these stories, please share these recordings with your friends and consider donating to help keep this podcast alive. A link to support us is also in the description. This is Taylor Seth Hall, and I'll see you next week on the Storytime Classics podcast.